With Friedrich now dead, the ducal title was passed down to his nephew, Jakob Kettler. Unlike his predecessor, Jakob was an adult when he was bestowed this responsibility. Another interesting thing about Jakob is that he had big brain, and that big brain was put to use. Jakob turned a duchy that was still suffering from the effects of a war with Sweden and Sigismund III's meddling, and turned it into an economic powerhouse that could rival even the Dutch. The big question is, how did he do it? Let's start with his life before becoming Duke. Jakob Kettler was born in 1610. He was the son of Wilhelm Kettler and Sophie of Prussia. Sophie tragically died just a few weeks after Jakob was born. He was raised by his mother's relatives from the age of two. Wilhelm was banished from the Duchy of Kralin and Semigalia when Jakob was around six years old, and this meant that Jakob was no longer in the official line of succession. Jakob proved to be a very smart boy. When he was 13, he was studying at the University of Leipzig. That is, until his uncle, and current Duke of Kralin and Semigalia, Friedrich Kettler, called his young nephew to the duchy. He was welcomed with a ceremony as Friedrich's unofficial heir since he didn't have Sigismund III's approval. It would take a decade until Sigismund died, and Sigismund's heir finally accepted Jakob as Friedrich's heir. It would take a little less than a decade after that point for Jakob to finally become the duke. So in the meantime, he went around Europe. This trip had two purposes. The first was to add legitimacy to him as an heir. He would introduce himself to nobles all over Europe as the heir, and if he gives people a good impression, other nations would support Friedrich's possible heir. The other was to study. He knew multiple languages, including German, Dutch, French, Russian, and even Latvian, which was the commoner's language in the duchy. He went to multiple universities and studied history, philosophy, geography, shipbuilding, and economics. He would also be introduced to a certain economic theory, an economic theory called mercantilism. Mercantilism is a very important economic theory that deserves its own video to fully explore, which there are plenty of on YouTube. But the basic idea was that the goal of a state was to have as much wealth as possible, and that the best way to achieve that was to maximize exports and minimize imports. This theory will drive a lot of Jakob's ambitions. Finally, in 1642, Friedrich passed away, and it was Jakob's turn at the helm. Jakob Kettler understood that the only way for the duchy to have influence and, more importantly, make money, is to use the seas and to take advantage of trade, like the Dutch. He also understood that the duchy was in a perfect position for this. Not only did it have a lot of coast with a nice harbor, but it had locally produced resources that could support a low-cost shipbuilding industry and plenty of cheap labor. So with that, and the help of Dutch artisans, he built one of the largest fleets in Europe, in a surprising amount of time. Not only were they facilitating their own trade, but they were able to trade their own ships to other nations. Of course, Jakob didn't only make trade ships. The duchy's natural resources didn't just amount to stuff that could make shipbuilding easier. The duchy also had the resources to make soap, bricks, muskets, cannons, lumber, and plenty of other stuff. Before I move on, I should probably explain how Jakob Kettler could practically do what he wanted when the duchy's nobles gave Jakob's predecessors a hard time. While well, Jakob's position as duke wasn't as an absolute ruler, the Kettler family was designated as the largest landholder who was also in charge of industry and foreign policy. Also, since Jakob's goal was to make as much money as possible, it's not hard to see why the nobles would align themselves with that. Also, in 1646, Wladysław IV, the Polish king and Grand Duke of Lithuania after Sigismund III, gave his authority of customs over the duchy to Jakob Kettler. This meant that Jakob had pretty much complete control over the flow of goods into and out of the duchy, and control over tariffs. Now he could trade with anyone in Europe. The Dutch, Venice, Sweden, France, you name it. Jakob's neutral foreign policy also made it so that these trade deals were extra stable and attractive. To help you understand Jakob's accumulated wealth, Jakob sent 62 warships to help Charles I of England in his civil war. Charles eventually, uh, lost, and Jakob never ended up collecting the 74,584 pounds sterling owed. Adjusted for inflation, that's quite a lot. Despite this loss, the duchy's economic growth didn't slow. 
and Jakob Kettler got along fine with Cromwell, the new leader of England. But with all this economic growth, where is there to go? Well, there's one... uh... activity? I think the word is policy. There's one policy that mercantilism encourages. That's colonialism. That's right. With Jakob's fleet, he planned to sail across the ocean and settle a different continent. Jakob especially wanted something in the New World. There was one island in particular that seemed like a good place for a settlement. The island of Tobago. The Dutch tried to set up something on the island, but Native Americans and the Spanish had successfully squashed that endeavor. The first time Jakob tried getting involved in the Caribbean was all the way back in 1642, almost immediately after becoming the Duke. He financed an attempted settlement on Tobago from some Dutch dudes. The point of the settlement was to get some trade going with the Arawaks. The settlers actually made it to the island, but got attacked by some natives from St. Vincent who were at war with the Arawaks. Their fate is foggy. Jakob paid more attention to domestic issues until 1651. Instead of America though, Jakob went to Africa, specifically the Gambia. Jakob was allowed by multiple native tribes to settle on two places on the mainland and on an island. The island was called St. Andrew's Island, though now it's known as Quinta Quinte. These settlements were supposed to allow Jakob to dominate the trade in the Gambia River, trade that was very lucrative at the time. Jakob was relatively friendly to native tribes, so despite the harsh conditions and harassment from other European powers who didn't appreciate this lowly duke getting in their way, the colony was fairly successful. In 1653, a man named Otto Steele was put in charge of the island. Despite the costs of maintaining such a settlement, this probably helped the duchy's rise in economic power, since Jakob tapped into resources that were usually limited to the Western European monarchies. But there was still potential for more economic growth, and colonial success. If he had a colony in the New World, he could have his own transatlantic trade network that would net Jakob much more profit. Tobago was still unclaimed. Well, technically it belonged to the Earl of Warwick, but he wasn't doing anything with the claim. But in November 1653, the massive warship known as Das Wappen der Herzogen von Courland, which translates to the coat of arms of the Duchess of Courland, headed towards Tobago. By the way, quick tangent, in 1645, Jakob Kettler married Louise Charlotte of Brandenburg, so that's the Duchess the ship's name is referring to. The ship finished its fairly uneventful journey in May of 1654. Mullins named the island New Courland, and over the coming months, the settlers would struggle hard. Unlike the settlements in the Gambia, the locals were a lot less friendly. Not all of them were absolutely hostile, but some were. Also, the tropical weather was unbearable to many, and disease was very common. Despite the struggles, the settlement survived. A fort called Fort Jakob was created, and around that a village as well as multiple plantations in modern-day Plymouth. These plantations produced many things like ginger, indigo, and sugar. New World plantations are infamous for, to put it lightly, a very immoral practice. That practice being chattel slavery. In this series, I try to portray the Duchy of Courland and Semigalia in a generally good light. This is mostly to make it easier to engage with the videos, and who doesn't like a good underdog story? But history is filled with disgusting things, and I don't want to hide that. Despite my thoughts on slavery, this system proved effective. Once again, just like in the Gambia, despite the cost of maintaining New Courland, the resources it provided increased the amount of wealth Jakob could amount and increased the duchy's standing in Europe. But the duchy's limitations started to show themselves. In 1654, a group of Dutch settlers wanted to settle on Tobago as well. This venture was also successful, but they made it to a different side of the island. It didn't take long for them to discover each other, but neither side felt the need to kick the other one out, so they both split the island between them. The problem, well, for Jakob at least, was that the Dutch side was better in a few ways. It wasn't near the traditional canoe routes that the natives took, so they were attacked much less than the Caronian side. This also meant that it was a safer place for European ships to stop if ever they wanted to land on the island. So even if they wished to make their way to Fort Jakob, for example, they would probably dock at Lampson's, which was the name of the village at that point. Although all of this was disadvantageous for Jakob, he wasn't deterred, 
and his colony was still profitable despite the competition. In fact, Jakob was ready for more. He went to Pope Innocent X and proposed a plan. He was going to send 40 ships with 24,000 people to Australia, which was discovered fairly recently. He wanted the Pope's funding in exchange for allowing Catholic missionaries to hop on and convert all the aboriginals. The duchy was supposed to be a Lutheran state, but Jakob isn't the type to let religion get in the way of profit. It didn't matter anyway, because in 1655, Innocent died, and his successor was less keen on the idea. Despite having to throw out this idea, the duchy's economic rise didn't stop. It seemed like nothing could stop Jakob. But there's a reason that you're not taught about the Coronian Empire. 